For each craft or service, there was a trade guild attempting to control competition while upholding quality through surprise inspections. Paris had 120 different guilds. Each guild was run by members working in its field. Officers were usually elected by masters only, but sometimes journeymen could also vote. A craftsperson would be fined by the guild if, for example, caught claiming that an object was made entirely of metal when its core was simply wood. Substandard products were confiscated and given to the poor. Its maker was fined for the object's price. Since it was possible to create famine by fixing prices through the monopolization of foods, guilds forbid a food seller from contracting at a farm for its eggs or cheese and such. The food seller had instead to wait for the farmer to arrive at the market and then compete in public against other bidders. Guilds kept occupations apart by requiring, for example, that tailors make only new clothes and not repair old, existing clothes, and that the clothing repairers never make new clothes. Guilds also set employee wages and adopted holidays. Guilds set rules concerning apprenticeship durations along with the number of apprentices that one shop could train. Masters were to feed, lodge, and clothe their apprentices, treat them as the child of a good family. Apprentices received training in exchange for their mostly wageless labor. Some apprentices were given a small stipend and some were sent for weekly lessons in writing and arithmetic, but others were beaten. Few apprentices were married. Parents paid a fee to have their child apprenticed in certain fields. Apprenticeships lasted four to eight years, but usually five. The duration of an apprenticeship could be shortened if the student's parents paid a fee to the master. Apprenticeship in goldsmithing and other metalworking fields might last 10 years. To demonstrate mastery of their field, apprentices created a masterpiece. Apprentices had then to show enough funds and equipment to go into business on their own. They then took an oath and paid a fee to the lord or prince who owned the guild. Lords sometimes sold their incoming providing guilds to other lords. After repeating the same motion, 14 hours per day for decades, the bodies of many craftspersons became crooked and bent. Each guild helped ill or destitute members, and they helped pay hospital and funeral expenses. These activities were often handled by an auxiliary association called a brotherhood. Each brotherhood had its own patron saint who was related in some way to that field of work. By the year 1300 in Europe, there was more demand by volume for wool than for grain. Wool was grown in the north and then sent south to Flanders, France, and Italy to be made into cloth and clothing. Merchants obtained wool from many places, but the breed of sheep in England had the best hair. The resulting clothing was being bought by people throughout the continent. Each city and region carefully guarded its wool or cloth reputation. Cloth was also obtained from local linen or flax, silk from China, or cotton from India. Wool merchants began to insist that fleece be shorn in a barn, having a board floor. Merchants bought wool in quantity to obtain the lowest cost. A wool agent might form an agreement with or monastery to purchase its entire wool production in each of the next several years. A notarized contract would be made in triplicate, providing a copy for each participant. Several steps are involved in turning fleece into cloth. Fleece must be cleaned of dirt, beaten, combed to remove tangles and impurities, and to get the fibers to form parallel rows, carded to fluff its fibers, spun into thread, woven into cloth, brushed to remove clumps, dyed, cleaned of oils by a fuller, pressed, and folded. These steps were not performed within one factory building, but were done by a series of persons, each one doing one step, maybe more, and working within his or her own home. A cloth merchant might buy raw fleece and then take it to each worker, one after another, in that series of homes. 
The merchant bought, sold, and rebought the material several times as fleece became finished cloth. The Guise described this as a factory spread around town. The Guise mentioned the legal proceedings against Jehan Boinbroke, a cloth merchant and notorious skinflint, in the year 1286 AD. Boinbroke bought wool, sold it to a weaver, bought it back as cloth, sold it to a fuller for cleaning, bought it back, sold it to a dyer, bought it back, and finally sold it to his agents who would sell it at the market. He rented the homes of entire streets to his workers. He was taken to court for tyrannical dealings with the cloth workers. If there was a downturn in the price of any of the above cloth-making steps, he would simply refuse to buy back the cloth. The court case shows the exploitation of labor and the existence of class conflict, but also that justice could be obtained. One third of the claims were honored by the court. The loom was the only complex piece of machinery involved in the cloth making procedure, and this gave the weaver some leverage in disputes with entrepreneurs like Boinbroke. In fact, weavers brought the cloth industry of Douai to a halt in the year 1246 through one of the earliest labor strikes. Weavers refused to work for the low fees merchants were attempting to pay. The merchants managed to end this little uprising and hoped it would never return. We'll see that in a few centuries, merchants began to lease weaving frames and equipment to these workers who in effect became their employees. When merchants later began gathering that sequence of workers into a centralized building, the factory was born. In one generation, the production of sheep grew fourfold. The people of the time experienced a dynamically changing world. Sheep were becoming England's national treasure, and this caused the conversion of much cropland into fenced-in sheepland. This so-called enclosure movement displaced many English peasants from their farms, but fewer continental peasants because less shepherding was being done there. The displaced peasants simply packed their belongings and left the village, leaving a few wattle and daub homes and a church to crumble through time. The old stone manor house might then be slept in by sheep herders. By the year 1500, 10% of English villages had been abandoned. At the same time, a few craftspeople were moving to villages to circumvent guild memberships and restrictions. Yet other villages became proto-industrial towns. For example, Birmingham began to specialize in tanning and cloth making when its population was just 1,500 persons. Some cloth merchants made enough money to buy real estate. They might buy homes that would be rented to the weavers with whom they dealt. Rent was actually a payment against a home loan subject to a 10% interest rate. These payments might last for generations. The wealthiest merchants often became money lenders. They charged high interest rates to offset losses, even though the church denounced such usury. A debtor's property would be seized. Sometimes property could be seized from others living in the debtor's community because the community had a tradition of looking out for its reputation. Noblemen were the largest debtors. In fact, their loans might take more than a generation to repay. Sometimes a nobleman would levy a sales tax in his manor town to obtain repayment funds, while at other times the town would make a loan to a nobleman. Sometimes a nobleman would knight a merchant for his financial services. The Pope once halted all church services in Champagne until a count had paid his loan. To lift the ban, this count repented and promised to conduct a crusade. Once again, shame on the offensive crusader. Another loan of historical proportion was that of Edward III, who borrowed 250,000 pounds from Italian, German, Flemish, and English families so he could invade France. His bankruptcy in turn bankrupted those loaning families. One French king owned a banker in Lyons as much money as his entire kingdom earned in two years. Thirteenth century France had a set of ten annual trading fairs held in towns such as Troyes and Provence. Peasants attended the fair to see the sights and sounds of foreigners and to see the entertainment and animals they might also sell a hen. Mostly European wool and clothing was exchanged for oriental spices and silks and for luxury goods such as ivory and pearls from Syria, Morocco, Tunisia, and Egypt. Indigo dye was bought from India by Italian merchants. Italian dye makers had recently learned from Muslim suppliers how to make red and violet dyes from crushed insects and lichens. 
These luxury goods were brought to the fairs by Southern European traders who obtained them from Middle Eastern Islamic traders in Constantinople, Acre, Antioch, or Tripoli. Some of these Arabic traders had obtained goods from Oriental merchants. Arabic traders told incredible tales to the Europeans, including stories about lakes guarded by winged animals. In chapter 12, we saw that the kingdom of Saba spread similar rumors about monsters and flying serpents to protect their source of frankincense and myrrh. Worldwide transportation was expensive. A pound of mace cost as much as three sheep. Spices were guarded like diamonds at every step in their sale as purchasers watched for dilutions and checked weights. People also exchanged handicrafts, local animal skins, and Scandinavian furs along with iron, lead, tin, and copper from around Europe. Food could not be transported beyond a day-long journey because people could not carry more than needed to feed themselves for the journey. The price of a wagon load of wheat doubled when transported just 40 miles or 70 kilometers. Prior to the fair, roads would be busy with the cargo-filled wagons of merchants. Princes were expected to guarantee the safety of travelers on the roads within their regions and sometimes reimburse travelers who had been robbed. We saw a similar guarantee in ancient Mesopotamia. While attending the fair, the town's lord guaranteed safety for the merchants from dawn until dusk. Some towns used candles to provide nighttime street lighting. Robert Payne mentions that the 11th century Caliph al Mustansir ordered the streets of Cairo to be lit with oil lamps. To pay for this protection, the Lord collected an exit tax on goods taken out of the city. This was very profitable for the Lord. The Lord also collected tolls, a share of rents, weighing and notary fees, and court fees. In response to high court costs, merchants at some fairs demanded a separate fair court to try commercial cases. The fair court might arrest someone who hadn't paid a fee at the fair of another town. When a person owed a large debt from one fair, the fair court would threaten to bar all merchants from that debtor's town, who then made sure that the debt was paid. There were 28 licensed money chargers at the Troy's Fair, and there were also currency exchangers, pawnbrokers, money handlers, and loan makers. A merchant might deposit money with a handler at one fair to be collected at another fair. A loan might be repaid at the next fair, or its payment might be spread across the next three fairs. In a new development, some started selling the loans due to them at a discount to third parties who would collect the full loan. These notes were called letters of the fair and could be used at cash in other fair transactions. Since travel was dangerous, especially with a wagon load of goods, merchants typically contracted transporters. A transporter might receive one quarter of the sales profit but pay for all lost goods. Italian transporters typically supplied one-third of the capital for the enterprise and kept half the profits. Most European wholesalers were Italian. Ever since Roman times, Italy had Europe's highest level of business, and for this reason the European Renaissance began in Italy. Many languages would be heard at the fairs. Arabic traders introduced Europeans to many new things, and were our source for words such as bazaar, jar, magazine, tariff, artichoke, orange, muslim, gauze, sugar, and alum. Another occasional reminder of the Troy's Fair is that we still encounter Troy weight, in which there are 20 penny weight to the ounce and 12 ounces to the pound, as was the case for monetary denominations. Genoese merchant ships first made their way to England in the year 1277. Ocean-going transportation costs less than hauling goods over land. The medieval fairs began to disappear during the famines and plagues of the 14th century, but trade soon became ubiquitous. The Guise explained that these fairs and their wholesale exchanges were big business in its infancy and provided the basis for the Industrial Revolution. The growth in trade meant Europe was emerging from its Dark Age, which is an overly dramatic name for the period following the collapse of the Roman Empire. This growth in trade provided sufficient funds, which were unavailable and unimaginable just two centuries earlier, to build great cathedrals. These were being built in the new Gothic style. 
After many centuries in the shadow of their predecessors, architects were proud to have finally surpassed the abilities of the Romans. The increasing height of Gothic cathedrals was developed by stonemasons through experience only, not through the use of measurements or calculations of forces. The geometry of triangles and such was used to draw plans on parchment. The Gothic architects were among the most respected persons in society. They were not as specialized as are today's builders. One might simultaneously be a sculptor, painter, and poet who could build castles, wells, bridges, and water pipe systems. A Gothic cathedral combined the work of many persons, including sculptors, wood carvers, metal workers, and stained glass artisans who would travel from town to town working on cathedrals. About ten churches were being built each year in France alone. A church could be built in three years if funding was available, otherwise several generations might be required. Iron clamps and pots and bells of brass were made on site. A brass bell is made by pouring molten metal between two clay molds. After cooling, the molds are removed to free the bell, which is then cleaned and tuned. Tuning is done by laboriously removing brass from the inside of the bell, which also makes it thinner. Its brass contained 13 parts copper to 4 parts tin. The addition of tin was found to make bells more brittle, but gave them a better tone. A bishop would baptize a new bell with a prayer for faith, charity, and good weather. The inscription on one bell might read, Call the living, summon the dead. While that on another read, Sometimes joy, sometimes sorrow. Or perhaps, marriage today, death tomorrow. Gothic cathedrals were built by hand with help from newly invented wheelbarrows and people-powered or oxen-powered cranes used to lift materials. While Roman masons cut stones large enough to be held together by their own weight, Gothic masons used mortar to cement smaller blocks together. Romans built semicircular vaults of limited height, but Gothic masons built buttress vaults reaching successively increasing heights of 30, 35, 40, 45, and 50 meters. Spires would rise as high as 170 meters or yards. Such heights are truly awe-inspiring to every human who experiences them. They are examples of human artistic and technological capability. These vaults also provide much space that was filled with stained glass windows, which accounted for half the cost of a cathedral. At Chartres, 44 windows were paid for by princes and lords, 42 by town guilds, and 16 by bishops. Stained glass was made in a nearby forest because large numbers of trees were burned to melt the sand. Two parts ash, or beech wood, were combined with one part sand to make glass. Various coloring materials were added. Glass making techniques could not yet provide functionally clear home windows, but it made highly artistic stained glass cathedral windows. Astronomy and mathematics were studied and exchanged between every region of the world, including ancient Mesopotamia, Egypt, China, and India. Central and South America had to work alone. Our combined knowledge was accumulated through time and place. Those of us human beings who lived during medieval times along the Islamic equator inherited knowledge from the more ancient peoples of Babylonian, Greece, Rome, and India, and such added to it and then passed it on to other people, including those in Europe who were about to begin a renaissance. In the previous section, we met the Persian mathematic al khwarizmi who first described algebraic procedures in his 8th century book, Restoration and Reduction. Trigonometry was developed by Arabic mathematics for use in surveying and astronomy. Europeans were still relying on Arabic textbooks of medicine and astronomy, including the Commendium of Astronomy by Al Fargani. During the European Renaissance, astronomers were able to use 900 years of Arabic observational recordings. The science of optics was developed by Arabs making lenses for people with failing eyesight. In the year 1038 AD, Alizan published the optical thesaurus.
which was the basis for the telescopes and microscopes developed by the later Europeans. Arabs inherited ancient alchemy and turned it into the science of chemistry through experience with a large number of substances and processes. In the 8th century, Yabir studies made him the father of chemistry. While making medicines, Arab doctors were the first to experiment with distillation procedures. This process was further developed in the large-scale production of perfumes. The distilling industry was the first to have scientific procedures. Europeans soon used this process to distill drinking alcohol, which had never before existed. Demand for alcohol first grew during the plagues of the 14th century and laws were soon made to limit its use. Through the careful study of the separation and purification of salts, Arab technicians developed the industrial scale production of soda, alum, iron sulfate, and nitrate. These chemicals were exported for use in the textile and other industries. Nitrate makes gunpowder. The weapons of every time and place we've so far seen consisted of sword and bow and arrow. Nowhere in the world had iron and gunpowder been merged into cannon and then into handheld guns. This was first done in Europe, probably through a modification of Chinese bamboo firecrackers. Their low cost and lightweight mobility were their initial advantage over catapults and bastilla. Procedures of warfare among 15th century Europeans had to be rethought. Gunpowder enabled the wealthiest of kings and queens to merge feudal lands into nations. We have seen that in the year 1500 AD, cities existed throughout the world, and we have seen that each region of the world contributes in the advancement of human technology. But then, some European kings sought to expand their little empires by invading the people of other continents and using cannon and muskets to slaughter people. The victims were happily being human before they were killed. These kings claimed that they were exporting Christianity and superior ways, as did the westwardly expanding people of the United States. Both were demonstrating their momentary advantage in weaponry and their inferior morals. Gunpowder and European diseases allowed the slaughter of too many of the world's cultures. When one group of us human beings drives another culture to extinction, it is a crime as great as driving a species to extinction. Today we understand that success in life is measured in terms of healthy and happy children, families, and communities, not in militaristic expansion. Don't let your ruler try to convince his nation to do this today. In the dilemma of humanity, the technology of immoral weaponry is always closely related to those of more useful things. The need to understand gunpowder helped advance the science of chemistry, especially as it has led in the discovery of oxygen. The study of cannonball motion was necessarily mathematical and helped build the science of dynamics generalized by Galileo around the year 1590 and finalized by Newton in 1687. The technology to build cannons from iron tubes was also used to make steam engine cylinders. The development of fire using steam engines was inspired by the use of fiery explosions to impel cannonballs. The attempt to understand steam engines resulted in the science of thermodynamics. Today's car's engines also use fiery explosions within cylinders. The Dark Age of Europe was a time of little food, surplus, and trade. The people of medieval Europe suffered social and economic injustice through the manorial system. The medieval age ended as it is restrictive manorial system evolved into something less constraining and as its trade and population increased to levels requiring new solutions. The expansion of the wool industry and the growth of towns, markets, trade, and specialists meant Europe was emerging into a new age and beginning its renaissance. The guys explained that the European renaissance in art and thinking was in place by the year 1300, within the silver and goldsmith shops and in the fledging universities. Trade volume was doubling with each generation. Markets and commerce were developing into continental entities 
making some business persons and their taxing lord wealthy enough to fund art and architecture, scholarship, and universities. But famine and plague occurring in the 1300s delayed the full renaissance for another century. As plagues kill one-fourth of the population of Western Europe, the resulting labor shortage provided a reason to increase the use of mills and other mechanical devices. During the 1400s, Italian trading cities were among the first with public funds great enough to build monumental architectural works. This occurred as popes and princes were taxing commerce. European peasants won the end of the manorial system, changed their political system, and were necessarily in a questioning mood. They began to ask for proof of all ideas. This continued through the next few centuries as the Reformation and Renaissance as the Enlightenment and in the scientific method of obtaining facts and understandings from repeatable measurement. Criticism of the Catholic Church resulted in Luther's Reformation, which began in the year 1517. The decrease in burden of the general population was accompanied by a rebirth in the intellectual pursuits of art and scholarship. The rediscovery of art impelled artists to create realistic representations of people and objects. The people of the Renaissance wanted to reattain and then surpass the accomplishments, knowledge, and techniques of the past. The Renaissance happened as ideas and techniques bounced between people, each building on the successes of those coming before them. The people of the entire continent were contributing their talent as they became unconstrained by the manorial impositions and obligations. Still today, Economic and social constraints are keeping too many persons from contributing their talents to the flow of civilization. Our full human blossoming will occur when these unnecessary constraints are removed. You might like to read The Renaissance, A Short History by Paul Johnson. Here's a summary of portions of his book. Johnson explains that the Renaissance received a push from patrons, rulers, and cities competing to expand their power with embellishments of art and scholarship. For example, Federico da Montefeltro obtained his wealth through the mercenary trade. Johnson says it was a rare age in which political and military hegemony was particularly judged by cultural performance. At the same time, these leaders were committing cruel acts to expand their own power, as described in The Prince by Niccolo Machiavelli, which was written in 1513 AD. In case a new ruler had compassion for others and was not inhuman, Machiavelli explained how to act inhuman. He described the actual political and diplomatic workings of our leaders and explained that the ends justifies the means. On a local scale, some cities were busy attacking others in their attempt to control their region. Ferdinand of Aragon and Isabella of Castilla tied their crowns and gave full support to humanist scholarship in Spain. France was expanding through the years 1440 to 1527 by annexing Gascony, Burgundy, Provence, Anjois, Brittany, and Bourbon. A series of French kings wasted many lives and much money trying to invade Italy. We see that the nations of Europe were being built as glamorations of feudal hierarchies. Those lords having the largest number of underlords were at the tops of the tax collection pyramids and so were collecting the largest amounts of money and the greatest number of promissory soldiers. They were hence more likely to attempt to engulf neighboring pyramids. Such sloshing empires do not improve the well-being of their population. Payne describes the work of 14th century Arab philosopher Ibn Khaldun, who studied the typical demise of empires through the price of inflation, corruption, and waste. In contrast to Machiavelli's Manual of Courtly Procedures, Baldassare Castiglione wrote a manual of courtly etiquette for men and women that popularized the ideals of the Renaissance. Francois Rabilas wrote Gargantua and Pantagruel, describing humanism, body humor, peasants, academics, merchants, lawyers, and courtiers. He wrote in French using slang and dialect and made the French enthusiastic about their own language and its potential. His works were both banned and loved. 
The humanist Michael de Montagu wrote informal reflections on people, events, customs, and beliefs, and on life's milestones of birth, youth, marriage, sickness, and death. His work was among the first written in a modern conversational one. The development of art and scholarship in the Renaissance involved a series of contributions from many individuals. You might like to read in detail about the contributions of Erasmus, who wrote in Praise of Folly and Influence Cervantes, who described life in Don Quixote. Thomas More John Collette, Lorenzo Valla, Ulrich von Hutten, and Antonio de Nibridge. For centuries, European artists had depicted scenes of Christian saints and their stories. As the works of the Greeks became available in Renaissance Europe, they provided a new world of topics, tales, and inspirations for art. A new fashion exploded in art. The wealthiest of us might have Greek scenes painted on the interior walls of our homes or commission our own portrait. We would wear our best jewelry and want them to be included in the painting. People of the Renaissance were striving to get to the truth in scholarship and to present the truth in art. They were concerned with realistic descriptions of the world and so believed that the reality of the human form was best depicted in three-dimensional sculpture. Renaissance sculpture advanced as it bounced off a series of contributing artists. Nicola Pisano was among the first. He was supported by Frederick II, who imported ideas from the Eastern Mediterranean. Pisano's accurate depictions of the human body showed emotion and age in living, breathing individuals. Already by the year 1300, artists were studying the form and style of Roman ruins along with the technology that made them. For example, the lost wax process was once again used for sculpting figures the most difficult of which was that of the mounted rider. The Renaissance was fully underway in the year 1400 when an art competition was held in Florence and won by Lorenzo Ghiberti, who was selected by a team of 34 judges. You might like to look at some of the works in a variety of mediums. A Michelangelo Filippo Brunicelli, Jacopo della Quercia, Raphael. Leonardo da Vinci and the later masters such as Rembrandt Renaissance artists were versatile and enterprising they worked with any material and in any medium for which there was a market. Many studios were operating as profit-making businesses and signed contracts detailing the patrons' wishes. Much effort was expended to obtain reality and art. Actual body parts were recorded in plaster. Measured perspective was carefully duplicated.
and every mechanical and optical aid inventable was used. For example, Philip Stedman points out that a mirror can be used to reflect an image onto canvas so that the artist has only to trace the image. Any 15th century picture displaying mostly left-handers was likely made using such a mirror system. Perspective had been forgotten in the European Dark Age, but from 1430 on, every artist learned perspective. Leonardo understood that the human eye does not perceive scenes with mathematically precise perspective. The ancient Greeks knew to bulge one of the horizontal lines of temple tops so that they'd be perceived as parallel lines, though they were not parallel. Philip David improvements in musical notation allowed more precise and varied results. Musical ensembles became popular. Improvements in the technology of instruments allowed the development of the lute, viol, violin, trumpet, woodwinds, harpsichord, and the virginal. By the year 1600, compositions were requiring four octave instruments. Leon Battista Alberti published On Architecture describing every aspect of the trade, including definitions, concepts, materials, construction methods, town planning, building styles, water supplies, archaeology, restoration, and cost. Every builder used this book. Renaissance buildings spread across Europe as works were commissioned by kings and queens. The Kremlin in Moscow contains two Renaissance buildings. Soon, Baroque and Rococo would come into fashion. My favorite building is the Baroque bell tower of St. Sophia's Cathedral in Kiev. Instead of writing in Latin, works began appearing in French, English, and Spanish and such because writers wanted to reach a wider audience and were beginning to value their own local heritage. The Renaissance in literature began with Dante's Divine Comedy and Chaucer's Canterbury Tales. Johnson says that Chaucer and Dante emerged from a vacuum and had no equals for centuries. Chaucer's new magic was to understand the mind of others well enough to make personalities jump out of the page as no previous author had done. During the previous 1,000 years, there had been few works of poetry until Francisco Petrarca began its revival. He also advocated the study of both Greek and Latin grammar in the universities. Some humanists became private tutors for the children of wealthy families, including daughters, not just sons, as had been more common. For example, Poliziano taught the Medici family. Some members of the Medici family were amateur scholars and paid for translations, church and building expansion, and family palaces. Lorenzo Medici commissioned works of art and was a scholar and poet. He wrote about hunting, woods, nature, love, and short lives. He was a Renaissance man. As the Medici family moved in the government, they brought along their enthusiasm for culture. Two Medicis became popes, while another married the King of France and was mother to three more. The techniques and knowledge of Renaissance individuals spread through mass-produced books made in the printing press that was invented by Gutenberg. The steps leading to Gutenberg's machine include Chinese papermaking and block printing, transmitted to Europe through Muslim commerce. Water-powered paper mills of 13th century Italy and movable type placed into a letterpress. Gutenberg solved the last problems of combining movable type, punch cutting, composing, inking, 
and pressing paper with a modified screw press. It took him five years to print his first book, the Bible, which he finished in the year 1455. By 1460, he had printed an encyclopedia. Classic texts were the first to be printed. Printed books cost less than hand-copied versions, which continued to be made only in luxury editions. Before the printing press, only 100,000 books existed on the European continent. Only the largest libraries possessed 600 books. By the year 1500, there were 9 million books made by printing presses in over 60 cities throughout Europe. A press was first set up in Mexico in the 1550s and in Boston's Harvard College in 1638. The fashionable appearance of letters was chosen after a few decades of experimentation. For example, in 1501, Aldous printed a whole book in italic letters. Soon italic came to be used only for emphasis, contrast, or quotation. Carolingian minuscule, or Roman type, came to be the most popular type. If you are a professional typist in the year 2010, I expect you to type 85 to 90 words a minute. Yeah. If you were a type setter in 1838, I would expect you to have gone through seven years of an apprenticeship, and at the end of that time, you should be able to set a book page in one hour. There's only 1,100 characters on the average book page. Through the years 1500 to 1700 AD, our way of thinking changed as we came to realize the scientific method of building increasingly accurate knowledge and understanding from repeatable measurements. Much human talent has been demonstrated in the rapidly developing scientific, technological, and medical fields. Look how far we've come in the last few centuries. Our success is evident to each of us every few minutes as we use a machine or a medicine that is a result of these efforts. Before this time, we didn't make measurements. We just sat in place trying logically to deduce the ways of nature. During Aristotle's time in the 4th century BC, we thought that it was logical to assume that the motion of an object ceases when you stop pushing on it. A bowstring puts an arrow in motion, but what next keeps the arrow in motion as it travels through the air? We thought that something must keep pushing it, so we imagine that the air somehow rushes from the front to the back of the arrow to push it across the field. We had to wait 2,000 years before Galileo and others came along to begin measuring this aspect of nature. When we make measurements, then we find out how nature actually behaves, and nature always surprises us. Galileo explained that inertia keeps the arrow moving, and then Isaac Newton explained that force changes the velocity of an object. If there is no force, then the velocity will stay constant forever. As we continually improve the accuracy of our measurements, we also continually improve the accuracy of our understandings and the abilities of our technology. Brunowski and Maslisch explain that the scientific method changed our way of thinking about the world and that it cannot be unlearned. In the year 1687, Isaac Newton showed that the motions of the planets in the heavens followed the same equations as an apple falling to the earth. It came as quite a shock that there was an equation that even the motion of the planets and heavens obeyed, and it is pretty impressive that we human beings figured this out. Before Newton, there was little distinction between the natural and the supernatural. We thought that the starry sky was beyond nature, inaccessible to direct understanding, and surely made of material unlike anything found on Earth. Today's measurements of starlight finds that the atoms here, on the Earth, are the same as those in the stars. After Newton published his motion equations, other scientists began searching for equations that might govern other aspects of the world, including biology, geology, and society. 
we see that the questioning mood that produced the Renaissance also resulted in the scientific method. In the Western intellectual tradition, Bronowski and Maslisch point out that the inventor of the steam engine had a larger effect on our everyday way of life than did Napoleon. If Napoleon wanted to change the world, he should have been a folk singer, or at least a scientist. Electricity and computers have changed our civilization, while our most selfish political leaders have simply made temporary adjustments in the map. Ideas have a life of their own and serve as stepping stones to new ideas. The old ideas do not go away. They cannot be unlearned. Ideas in society continually interact and affect each other. The following description of elements of the Renaissance, the Enlightenment, and the Scientific and Industrial Revolution is a summary of the book by Bronowski and Maslisch. The kings and queens of Europe were sometimes oppressive. Western ideas of tolerance and personal liberty resulted from specific injustices. For example, certain kings and queens of Europe would select a church of their own preference and then dictate that everyone must attend that particular church under penalty of death. The questioning intellectuals of the Renaissance responded to this oppression with the development of the idea of religious freedom. In 1598 in France, the Edict of Nantes guaranteed religious tolerance in that people were free to attend the church of their choice. In England, it was not until 1689 that the Toleration Acts allowed the existence of religious sects. The new Free Church was a voluntary group unlike the intolerant State Church. Still today, we hold the idea of religious freedom as a basic tenet of individual rights. This idea is part of our civilization and cannot be unlearned. In the 17th century, intellectuals began to speak of political and constitutional issues. They also began to debate the role of the king and queen. King James I, who had the Bible translated into English, wrote True Law and Free Monarchy, in which he argued that the king has a divine right to rule and is above the law. Frederick here described how complete power might be obtained by those kings generating total fear. Some settled for fits of wrath. For example, Henry II, King of England, would throw himself to the ground in a fit of rage as did Hitler. Henry II said, The displeasure and wrath of Almighty God are also my displeasure and wrath. By nature, I am a son of wrath. Why should I not rage? God himself rages when he is wrathful. When 17th century kings and queens needed money for war, they would tax an item, perfume, for example. Parliament still consisting of only nobility, not common people, tried to require the king to obtain their approval before a tax could be levied. James's son, Charles I, also believed in divine right, but in 1628, when he needed money for war, Parliament forced him to sign the Petition of Right before they would give him any money. The Petition of Right asked the king to observe the rights of his subjects, demanded a stop to the billeting of troops, demanded an end to the trial of civilians by martial law, stopped arbitrary imprisonment, and stopped taxation without the consent of Parliament. This statement of individual rights has been repeated in many later constitutions and are now a part of our collective idea of civilization. In the 17th century, individual people now had religious and political ideals. 
economic and social ideals would develop in the 18th and 19th centuries. Some medieval kings claimed importance over individuals because the individual was only a piece to be used by the king in achieving the goals of the king. Such kings believed that their kingdom was more important than its people and that it was okay to repress people. The kingdom or state must hold its position of power among the other states. In response, the idea of the value of an individual is said to be humanism. Brunowski and Maslisch explained that those rulers believed that the tenets of morality did not apply to them or to their kingdom. Suppose that a person comes to your home and says, I must kill you for your food to feed my children. We all agree that this person's lack of food is no excuse for this immoral behavior. But a king will sometimes kill thousands of people to obtain a port, raw material, or any other object of interest. Normal people do not think this way. Such immoral behavior by a state is unacceptable by many persons. Today, many of us believe that the state exists for the people and that it must be concerned for the well-being of the people. The 4th century BC Confucian philosopher Mencius said that the measure of a ruler's virtue is the well-being of the people. In 1768 AD, Joseph Priestley published The First Principles of Government in which he stated that the happiness of the largest number of persons is the standard by which every social action must be judged. Ever since the first emperor invented the empire, military forces, and war around the year 2200 BC, the concerns of kings and queens has often been nothing except the maintenance or expansion of their own territory, wealth, and power. It has taken us some 4,000 years to overcome the tyranny of emperors who use people's lives for their own goals. The importance of the state is being replaced by the importance of the individual, and the concerns of government are becoming more closely related to the concerns of people. We measure success in life simply in terms of healthy and happy children, families, and communities, not wealth or power. This trend will continue until our civilization is viewed as a collection of us human beings and their mutual efforts, rather than as a collection of selfish kings and states who believe that they answer to no one. In many places, and at many times through the past 4,000 years, people felt that politics was something controlled from above. We often had a fatalistic acceptance of events as they were given to us. Pronounsky and Majlis explained that during the Renaissance, politics began to mean a more or less conscious participation of all strata of society in the achievement of everyday purposes. Do you feel that this is true in your nation today? At the time of the English Civil War, which occurred throughout the 1640s, people began to debate whether government should be by the people and for the people. Cromwell said that government should be for the people, but not necessarily by the people. Still others argued that there could be only a single decision maker, a king or queen, but wanted this ruler to be guided by the needs of the people. An enlightened despot, this idea played a large part in the French Social Revolution. Colonel Rainborough said that a person should be allowed to give consent to be under the government's authority. Ayrton asked, why should unpropertied persons be given a say in government if they have no financial stake in its operation? He said that that would be the end of civil law. Some of us today feel that government isn't about the protection of wealth, but the protection of individual rights and the well-being of the people. In 1649 in England, the House of Commons first assembled. Being chosen by the people and representing the people, the House has the supreme power in the nation. Popular assemblies, 
representational government, and the freedom of political views have become part of our view of civilization. The university intellectuals began an open debate over theories of state. Thomas Hobbes wrote Leviathan in 1651, arguing the absolute sovereignty of the state. In 1690, John Locke wrote Two Treatises of Government, in which he compared parliamentary government with a limited liberal state. Both these persons stated that contemporary troubles were the motivation for their work. Locke made government an object of rational analysis and based political science on reason, not tradition. Before that time, government was thought to be a veiled, divine institution that was above examination. It was accepted as traditional heritage. Locke said that there was no such thing as a divine right to rule and that kings and queens cannot claim that tradition gives them the right to rule. He said that the cause of the ruin of cities, the depopulation of countries, the disorder of the peace, is not due to the question of whether or not there is power in the world or from where it came, but who should have it. Even if power is dressed up with splendor, it must still show that it has a right to that power. Locke said that people are born free, equal, and rational. We have inalienable rights of life, liberty, property, and the right to punish anyone who harms us or our property. People create a political or civil society by appointing a government to protect their rights. The government does not give a gift to these rights, but instead protects them. The government drives its power from the consent of the governed. Supreme power lies with the people. Locke said that the true function of government is not to impose laws, but to discover the proper laws. He believed that there must be laws of nature that govern human society, just as Newton's laws governed motion. Locke was explaining the new realization that people didn't have to live under tyrants. Europeans began to talk about freedoms because they had just endured some centuries of restriction through the manorial system. In other regions of the world, daily life has never been unfree in these ways. While yet other governments have learned to keep people from talking about freedoms by making their daily lives so harsh that they must expend all of their efforts just to get daily food, as explained by Laszlo Magyar. In 1748, Montesquieu wrote The Spirit of the Laws, in which he compared democracy, aristocracy, monarchy, and despotism. He argued that the best government is a balance of power and divided government into executive, legislative, and judicial branches. He said that liberty was lost whenever one person or group has all of these three powers. Today, we want to ensure that no individual can dictate the goals, policies, and actions of the entire nation. Democracy is, firstly, a blending of views that partially satisfies all persons and groups. A consensus is required before any action can be taken. Much of daily politicking is the attempt of one person or group to convince others to adopt their view and create legislation that will turn this view into law. In contrast, dictators have to convince nobody. Montesquieu's ideas influenced both the French and American revolutions. He also created sociology by comparing and discussing classes of people. He felt that social facts were subject to natural laws, just like Newton's equation of motion. Rousseau said that the collective consciousness and the will of the people can be determined by counting votes. Voting would direct the General Assembly and guarantee that its decisions represent the general will. The laws of a society do not appear out of nowhere. They originate and operate by the consensus of the people. Laws represent the way of life that the society has adopted for itself. 
The will of the people is to ensure the general welfare. In England, the Reform Bill of 1832 first gave the middle class a voice in government. Our view of civilization now includes the idea of making decisions by counting votes. Rousseau also promoted nationalism, which had not yet existed before that time. Today, some of us promote the global view of humanity. In the year 1776, the Declaration of Independence of the United States could proclaim, We hold these truths to be self-evident because these truths had just recently become self-evident. The writers of the U.S. Constitution had the opportunity to put into action some of the political ideas of the European intellectuals from the previous centuries. The goal of the writers was to protect against absolute power because people had learned the hard way about injustice and tyranny. The Bill of Rights of the United States contains protections against the list of injustices that had been committed by previous kings and queens. It is a summary of our idea of individual liberty as had been learned the hard way. The Constitution of the United States developed a federal system of joining independent states. Taking the advice of Montague, it also designed to ensure that power is shared and balanced between the legislative, executive, and judicial branches of government. Pronounsky and Majlik explained that the English-speaking colonies of North America were located far from their English government, so the population already had control of the local systems. They did not have to capture the government, but only to defend their rights from the encroachment of the distant English government. The American Revolution was begun by, and largely controlled by, the upper class. It did not become a social revolution, as would occur a few years later in France. Through the last two centuries, the changes in the idea of government in the United States include the end of human slavery, the right to due process of law, income tax, voting rights for those of us who have been enslaved or are female, equal opportunity for all of us, and the redistributions of the welfare state. In the last century, the enlargement of the U.S. government has been a late and reluctant response to the social and economic consequences of the shift from farming to factory work, where people are both the wage earners and the customers of the factories. The South African Bill of Rights was enacted in 1997 and contains protections against a more modern and thorough list of injustices. Guarantees include equality, life, dignity, work, access to governmental information, movement and residence, business, occupation, fair treatment at work, the right to unionize and strike, the right to a healthy environment, education in your own language, and to have housing, health care, food, water, and social security. All children have the right to parental care, shelter, and healthy food and may not be neglected, abused, or forced to work. One ancient Greek noted that the people in India depict gods as Indians, Africans depict gods as Africans, Greeks as Greeks, and if cows were to draw gods, they would surely depict them as cows. In the 15th century, European traders and travelers began to write about the people of distant regions who took their own way of life just as seriously as Europeans took the European way of life. In 1721, Montesquieu wrote Persian letters in which the customs of France were described from the point of view of two Persian visitors. In 1726, Jonathan Swift wrote Gulliver's Travels. Comparative travel literature asserted the existence of a natural ethics that was independent of the particular customs of any group of persons. Some philosophers felt that there should be ethical laws as clear as there are laws of geometry 
and that these laws should be self-evident to all persons. Today, natural ethics is understood to be that which is innate to a social species, that is, the golden rule. In past ages, no one thought that the future would be better. Instead, things were considered to be static and permanent. The Industrial Revolution resulted in the idea of change and progress. Hegel said that people are history. To understand people, you have to understand history. In the past, history had been used mainly to present examples that might argue a certain moral point. Now, history is important for its own sake. Today, we look at the history of everything. We believe that we understand the present better when we understand the past, and we always look to the future. Around the year 1700, the university study of statistics and economics made people begin to realize that the wealth of a nation lies in its capacity to produce goods. Before this time, rulers believed that wealth was measured by the amount of gold in their treasury. In 1776, Adam Smith wrote The Wealth of Nations, in which he created the modern science of supply and demand economics. He pointed out that not just gold, but also labor is a source of wealth because labor produces products that in turn produce wealth. He said that nations can become wealthy by exporting more goods than they import. Adam Smith also said that the greater part of people's misery is easily removed by increasing education and ensuring the decent living conditions that result from increased wages. Before the Industrial Revolution, each product was made in a home. Since many steps were needed to turn fleece into cloth, and each step was done in a different home, a single cloth merchant took the progressing material to each of those homes. The merchant sold the material to each home and then bought it back after that home had completed its step. The only step that required equipment was the weaving done on a loom. In medieval Europe, the home weaver bought the thread, owned the frame, and sold the cloth. During the economic downturn of 18th century England, Many weavers began leasing their frames from that merchant. In effect, these weavers had become wage earners. The wool merchant, or cloth seller, came to own the thread, frame, and cloth. Some merchants brought all of their equipment into a single building, a factory, where they could exercise more control over the entire process, including the hours of the workers and the quantities of produced goods. The workers were then traveling to that building to do the work, instead of the work being taken to the home of the worker. This was the start of the factory that began our Industrial Revolution around the year 1760. The Industrial Revolution was a change in manufacturing technique, the factory, not a change in machinery. In the year 1750, Materials were taken to the homes of the villagers to be processed into a product. By 1800, workers instead went to the factory. Within two generations, the customary way of running industry changed, and human civilization changed from consisting of farmers to factory workers. We worked in one factory and used our wages to buy products made in other factories. This was as dramatic a shift in our way of life as had occurred 10,000 years earlier when we changed from being gather hunters to being farmers. What is next for us as factories and stores require no workers and robots are everywhere. In the factory, many persons would simultaneously make thread that fewer persons would weave in the cloth. With the concentration of people, Water mills were soon used to power factory machinery. The first spinning machines were invented in 1760. New machines were continually invented to reduce each newly found bottleneck in every manufacturing process. The Industrial Revolution began in England 
where lots of streams flowed year-round to provide water wheel power. Soon, water-powered factories were built in most every rural area that possessed such streams. It is significant that these factories were not located in urban areas where they would have met fierce opposition from guilds. Before the Industrial Revolution, our homes typically contained about 20 items, two pots and a ladle, a few wooden or earthenware plates, a chicken feather bed, a candle holder, and some candles, and two sets of clothes. We had no curtains, pictures, carpeting, or painted homes. A log may have served as a bench, and we often used sharp sticks as forks and clamshells as spoons. Only the richest of us, the so-called nobles, could afford to pay other persons to hand make these utensils and decorations. The rest of us made many of our own basic utensils using any handy material. Factories mass produced clothing, utensils, and decorations at a fraction of their previous price, and this meant that most every worker could afford to buy them. The number of items in a home grew from 20 to 200. We were both the producer and the consumer of these items. For example, by 1830, 20% of U.S. homes had a carpet. The contents of the homes of the wealthiest of us were less changed by the Industrial Revolution. In the year 1850, they still looked much like those from the year 1750, or even 1650, in that items were mostly handmade from expensive materials. As increasing numbers of persons bought factory-made products, increasing numbers of persons were needed to work in increasing numbers of factories. The number of consumers, factory workers, and factories increased together because each requires and promotes the other two. Soon, most everyone was working in a factory, most everything was made in a factory, and factory workers were buying most everything they used from those factories. Notice also that the purchases of factory workers depends on the wages that they are paid. The more wages they are paid, the more goods they can purchase, and the greater the number of factories are needed to make those goods. But most factory owner instead chose to keep wages as low as possible at his own factory. This led to the commercialization, or buying and selling, of most everything in a search of profit and provided the opportunity for non-living wages and poor working conditions to develop. These conditions were quickly followed by discussion and attempted solutions as government was forced to take on a whole new range of responsibility. The steam engine began as a power source to remove water from mines. James Watt improved the steam engine and sold them to factories. Since factories no longer had to be located near a stream, they were moved to populated cities where laborers could be found. The coal industry rapidly expanded to supply the steam engines of the factories. Steam power replaced stream power after about 1840. The steam engine provided more power than the water wheel and allowed machines to become larger and more complex. Chemical processes were also improving. In 1709, people found how to make coke from coal. Coke produces enough heat to reduce iron ore so that iron quickly became the common material. The new industry of iron produced the railroad industry and then the automobile industry. With each emerging industry, a few persons would become as rich as a nation, as will be discussed further below. Today's new industry is the computer and its internet 